The social conditions of gender in the early republic could not sustain it. The path to equality for women was blocked by dependency and subordination in households that were the property of men and where women's energies were exhausted by the tasks of social reproduction. In this context, expectations of equality could easily be diverted into other channels where women found work and worth and food for a distinctly feminine imagination. The voice of simple equality was muffled by a print culture that overflowed with celebrations of feminine domesticity, much of it penned by ambitious and talented women. The 19th century would find women occupied in their homes, subordinated in the labor markets, or practicing social benevolence in an unobtrusive womanly manner. Historians have clearly demonstrated that women's places had their own intrinsic rewards and would, over the course of the 19th century, open up many avenues to power outside the home and in the public realm. This womanly world was too expansive and invested with too much cultural value to be called unequal. It would reach its zenith near centuries close in the epic known as the woman's era among African Americans and progressivism for white reformers. Despite their accomplishments, the female giants of the progressive era did not often speak in the language of sex equality. Partially as a consequence, the programs they sponsored institutionalized gender differences and propagated sexual inequality. Those members of the progressive coalition who found their way into policy making during the New Deal were shunted into separate and secondary positions where they drafted policies that were written with inequities to women and mothers when lesser welfare benefits accompanied by extensive surveillance to men and soldiers when generous and unconditional public compensation. After 1920, and despite women's suffrage, women's political influence, while hardly exhausted, seemed to stall. Women remained a small minority of office holders. Wives and mothers entered the labor force in growing numbers, but secured low status jobs and paltry wages compared to men. When a new women's movement placed gender on the public agenda late in the 1960s, the Equal Rights Amendment was finally pushed through Congress, but never secured ratification. Equality was a prominent motif and implicitly the backbone of the second wave, but probably not the dominant language. The National Organization for Women set out to bring women into the mainstream, mainstream in partnership with middle class men. The young, scruffy, more rebellious contingent of the second wave, uh, some of whom are represented here today. They're probably in disguise because we've got to act together fashion-wise. <laughs> I'd like to have that, that long overdue discussion about when we finally shaved our legs. Wages and 
men's contributions to housework rose to significantly higher levels and at a faster pace than ever before. Could it be that even as the demands of the equality of the sexes had grown quieter, some invisible hand of economic change is about to erase the inequalities that have been women's law throughout our history? Will the steady erosion of gender, gender division of labor wash away sexual inequality? Is that divide between mother and breadwinner, along which previous campaigns for gender equity faltered about to dissolve? And will the promise of the equality of the sexes, gleaned by Judas Sargent Murray over two centuries ago, finally be realized? With that flamboyant proposition, I'm going to hastily be my retreat from contemporary history and talk a little bit about historiography. And when I look at current history, as practiced by the people in the room, um, I see a certain analog to this kind of disconnect of the late 20th century and the 21st century between movements for sexual equality and gender change, even positive gender change. Three recent trends in historiography come to mind. First is the body of recent writing that has demonstrated how individual women can make their way very masterfully past the barrier of sexual inequality to find power and status. I think of Catherine Alger's portrait of the demure ladies of Washington in the early republic who operated the levers of federal power from their tea tables. Or of Mary Kelly's accounts of how women achieved a rich subjectivity through reading and writing even while sequestered under the severe patriarchy of southern plantations. Other historians have found women prospering in the farthest and darkest corners of an unequal society, as leaders of anti-suffrage campaigns, the KKK, the New Right. Writing the history that women made in the backwaters of sexual inequality is a major and an awfully brilliantly done strain the second strand I point to is um, the way that recent scholarship has proved Mary Beard's claim that women are a force of history, or to use the word or the title of Leanne White's book, Gender Matters. Southern history is one of the major beneficiaries of this historiography. Kathleen Brown demonstrated that gender shaped the institutionalization of slavery. Stephanie McCurry showed how the domination of women cemented the class relations that brought on civil war. Laura Edwards, Martha Hodes, Amy Drew Stanley, Glenda, uh, Glenda Gilmore, among others, exposed the sexual underpinnings of Jim Crow. Other historians, too numerous to name, have shown women to be a powerful force in the history of the 20th century, particularly in their work on the welfare state. Practitioners of the new Indian history have also been apprised that gender matters by such works as Julianne of Alvarez, Peace and Aim, and the Form of a Woman. Barb's demonstration of how gender influenced the outcome of encounters between Europeans and Indians on the Texas frontier also reveals how the power of gender, like the agency of women, does not always align neatly with the equality of the sexes. In fact, the two may operate in opposition to one another. For example, for those women so critical to the diplomatic relations between Indians and Europeans um, on the Texas frontier, as described by Julianne Barr, were objectly, abjectly unequal. Captives and enslaved, they were traded between tribal chiefs and European invaders. In other words, in inequality of the sexes becomes historically powerful. Much of this work, which I deeply admire, holds sex equality at bay as it deploys women and gender as explanatory factors in the study of other, some would say, larger historical issues. Before I address this contradiction, let me offer one last example of how the shadows of sexual inequality play upon recent historiography. Again, it comes from one of the richest bodies of contemporary historical scholarship, studies of African American women's history. 